California or a flood in Bangladesh or an avalanche in the Himalayas. We get people even going on, you know, things like TV and offering opinions and saying, well, if there is a God, why would he allow this? He didn't bring it about. Adam is the one who rejected the life God gave him. We're the ones who continued on in that rejection. God has nothing to do with it. If you want to go and see who causes ferries to sink and mountains to fall down, go home and look in a mirror, because the sins are ours, are mankind, not God. So that spiritual separation from death, which Adam inaugurated, is also overcome when Jesus rises from the dead, establishes his church, ascends into heaven, all of those things. Do away with that if, of course, we are faithful. You see, it always comes down to our choices. God has done absolutely everything necessary for us to share a life But he can't live it for us. We're the ones who have to be willing to live in faithfulness and righteousness in terms of following Christ daily. And that's where some of us become almost kind of atheists. Not in terms of denying that there is a God, but in continuing to live as if there were no God. And the chapter beforehand, Second chapter, 20th verse. St. Paul writes, If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the universe, and the elemental spirits of the universe are those, those things which are in opposition to God, Satan, his demons, all of that. If you have died with them, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? And we do. At least I do. You know, I will go home, I'll recover for a couple of days, and then I'll, you know, get ready for my next trip, but I'll be grumping about, you know, who did this, that, and the other thing in that particular congregation. And so, Lord, when are they going to listen to what I have to say, what have you? Because we tend to live as if everything we commemorated this week didn't really happen. Now, I remember what I told you one of the times, like, which now? about God and time. That God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he are not, Holy, Holy Trinity, are not <coughs> bound by time. Time only affects the creation and us in the creation. <coughs> so, for God, there's no yesterday. For God, there's no tomorrow. There is now. Now, for those of us who run according to the clock, have to be at work at a certain time, got to be at church at a certain time, got to be here, got to be there, that can be a hard concept to wrap your brain around. But for God, everything that we commemorated this weekend happens all the time. We don't mean by that that we, we, we sacrifice Christ, but that his offering of his sacrifice goes on for all time until the second coming. So we don't commemorate an event, we participate in it. It's almost as if for us the church was a time machine that took us right back to what Jesus endured and experienced during his life. So Paul goes on and he says, when Christ, who is our life, appears, that we may also appear in glory, we have to concentrate on the things that are above. We have to concentrate on the things of God. And again, this is our choice. We can continue to live as if the world and the things in the world were more important to us than God, or we can say, no, you know, this resurrection thing has, you know, mystery written all over it has importance written all over it, and I've got to start living that way. Because my life is now hidden with Christ and God. 
What we can do, and this is the raw response, is continue in our passions. Paul says, put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you, fornication, that sexual morality between people, impurity, that's the Bible code word for gay sex, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is, and this I think is the interesting description, all of this, he says, is idolatry. Idolatry. Now we know what an idol, idolatry is. Idolaters worship idols. The Canaanites did that. The Phoenicians did that. Many of the people in the Old Testament times did that. Many people at the time of our Lord worshipped Diana and Zeus and all of those gods and had little, you know, made uh, statues of them. You know, on their Super Bowl day, they drove their chariots around with those little statues of Zeus on them, you know, hoping they're not going to get themselves killed or something like that. But yet he says, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness are idolatry. The reason being that when we sin, when we give in to our passions and our pleasures, apart from God, we are worshiping ourselves. It's a self-idolatry. Now the scripture is clear, no idolatry can be in the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> so if the result of our Easter is just to go back to business as usual, just to go back to committing the same sins, getting wrapped up in the same situations, then we kind of fall into that atheism, which may acknowledge God's existence, but does absolutely nothing about it. He goes on and he says, put these things away. But I, I mean, he says, on account of these things, things mention the wrath of God is coming. Now, the wrath of God is not what you look like at 6 o'clock in the morning. The wrath of God is God's hatred of sin. Not the sinner. Never, ever, ever does God hate a sinner. He desires not the death of a sinner, but that we should repent and live. But he hates those things which cut him off from us. And that's his wrath against those things. So he says, put off anger, wrath, malice, slander, foul talk from your mouth, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old nature with its practices, and have put on the new nature which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of the Creator. Like I said, if we go back to business as usual, we begin to self-destruct. And God, who has given us freedom, who has already sent three boats in the helicopter, you know, isn't going to stop us because we're free and we want to be free. God loves us so much that he allows us to go to hell if we so choose. He'll call after us. He'll send patriarchs and prophets and teachers. Sometimes he even sends angels and archangels. He'll do everything he can to convince you this is the wrong way to go. One thing he will never do is stop you from going that way if you wish to. God loves us too much to control us. God loves us too much to prevent us from living freely, even if it means denying now we can go the negative way that way, or we can say, as he says, put on God's chosen one, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, patience, forbearing one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. The resurrection is about life and restoration. How many relationships have we killed? How many families have been pulled apart? How many friends have been pushed away by our anger, by our wrath, by our malice, 
by the false and superficial judgments we make about other people, often without having all the facts, but that doesn't tend to slow us down a great deal when we get into that kind of mode. That's not what the resurrection is about. The resurrection is about embracing those who have hurt you, forgiving those who have abused you, opening your hearts to those whose hearts are closed and stony. Because Christ rose from the dead to change fear into hope, anger into joy, long-suffering into patience, and above all, compassion. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. I believe in one God. Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God and Son of God, the God who is Father before all worlds, God of God, the light of light, very God and very God, the God of not made, but we went among substance of the Father, and in whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation, and came down from heaven.
Hallelujah, first this morning, and thanksgiving to God for this congregation, for these people here, and for all those who have participated in the spiritual life that we enjoy. <coughs> Brethren, pray that this my sacrifice of yours may be acceptable unto God and the Father Almighty. May the Lord receive this sacrifice of thy hands to the praise and glory of his name, both for our benefit and that of all his holy church.
evermore praising thee and saying, oh. Say to give unto us some portion of fellowship of my holy apostles and with John, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellus, 
Peter, Felicitas, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucia, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and of all my saints within whose fellowship it is to be. And although we are but worthy to go manifold things, to offer and be yet we beseech them to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ.
Behold the Lamb of God, behold him that taketh away the sin of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. Thank you. 